start the second half of our presentations this afternoon, so if you can take your seats. Um, our first presenter this afternoon is Ali Ray Baum, and uh, she's going to be presenting on the non-objectifying voyeurism in John Sloan's The Cough. Can you uh, show your appreciation for her? The New York public was introduced to John Sloan Sakat as the doors of the Macbeth Gallery opened on February 3, 1908. The walls of the gallery were covered with the works of seven of Sloan's paintings and of the art of seven other American artists. Among those, there were four others of which with Sloan were deemed the apostles of ugly and were popularly known as the Ashcans. These artists painted New York's urban street scenes, which were scenes that were previously ignored as subjects by American artists. Sloan's image, displayed at the Macbeth Gallery, portrayed mostly women interacting with one another as well as men. Yet the cot is different, for she is just a single woman in a domestic interior. I'm just going to click through some of the other images that he displayed at the gallery. In six of the seven images displayed, Sloan depicted a vibrant scene of social interaction between men and women, or women with women as men watch. These are scenes of everyday life of the Manhattan lower or middle class. Women get their hair processed in open windows because they cannot afford private hairdressers. Or they cavort in the public streets as men watch without the slightest bit of social hesitation, as well as go to movies together without the obvious escort. These are scenes of Manhattan that the Ashcan fervently portrayed in their artwork, the real life of New York citizens who Sloan experienced on the American city streets. Yet interesting Sloan's seventh image, the cot, uh, excuse me, differs in his portrayals of the lower middle class, for it is an intimate moment of un an unidentifiable woman dressed only in a simple chemise, as she seems to be readying herself for bed, hiding her face away from the viewer within a nondescript background, interior, excuse me. This is simply an image of a woman in her bed. Sloan creates a moment of a serene dignity for his female subject. The Sloan wasn't widely received during the traveling show of the Ashcans in 1908. One critic wrote that this image was, quote, a not alluring a glimpse into the private life of a lady not disconcertingly beautiful, who is in the act of retiring for the night. One is curious as to the theories of art which lies behind the execution of this image." End quote. Most critics who did re review this image mostly found fault with Sloan's lack of, quote, good taste, end quote, which begs the question, why? My thesis examines the specific subject and stylistic choices of Sloan in his image, The Cot, as directly relating to the negative reviews or complete disregard of the image during the traveling exhibition of the independent artists. Mm -hmm. It considers the cot as a specific representation of a lower class woman in America, in which Sloan captures in a non-objectifying style that denies the masculine gaze of the observer. This paper ascribes to Griselda Pollock's conception of the masculine gaze, in which she maintains that the male artists attained a possessive gaze through the social hierarchy of the late 19th century, in which women were seen as inferior to the, mas to the male superior. This paper defines non-objectifying voyeurism in regards to Sloan as a two-part definition. In one regard, Sloan does not portray the female subject as a physical object within the domestic interior. On another level, Sloan's observational style of capturing the subject further does not objectify her, for he dignifies his subject through not utilizing the detached masculine gaze. With regards to the term voyeurism, I am aware that an audience observation of an intimate moment excuse me, can be seen by definition as voyeuristic, However, by Sloan denying the audience eye contact with the subject, he therefore denies a masculine authoritative gaze and creates his own style of painting, which is a non-objectifying voyeurism. Sloan therefore refuses to implement three, if not more, traditional artistic concepts in the cot. One, he did not paint according to the high art acceptable subject. Two, he did not adhere to the masculine gaze. And three, he did not create an aestheticized image of the subject. Few, if any, artists created genre images, and by genre images, I am referring to images of everyday life, um, of women similar to Sloan. To Sloan, so, excuse me, Sloan's artistic contemporaries who painted genre images of women, such as John White Alexander, women were still largely considered as decorative objects. Curiously, artists who departed from the template of women as decorative objects in genre images, such as Edgar Degas, ended up depicting them as less dignified than Sloan. John Sloan therefore created a new genre imagery of women with the cot that represented a trend towards a more re realistic, dignified portrayal of women in a new progressive age in American art. The apparent voyeurism in Sloan's style has been a source of controversy amongst 
arts historians. Though I must note that in their writings, the cot is rarely incorporated into their studies of Sloan's artistic style of painting. These art historians have observed at length Sloan's choice of female subject and the way in which Sloan portrays women. While some assert Sloan's innocent intention in his portrayals of women, seeing Sloan as a common spectator, others insist there's a sexual and psychological intention in his images of women. What art historians tend to manipulate in their specific renditions of Sloan's observational style is what he says about his own style of painting. He stated, I am in the habit of watching every bit of human life. I can see about my window, but I do it so that I am not observed at it. I peep through real interest not being observed myself. I feel that it is no insult to the people who are watching to do so unseen, but that to do it openly and with great expression of amusement is an evidence of real vulgarity. In his own words, Slow defines his mode of observation as lacking the objectifying voyeuristic tendencies that are evident in many of the female images of the late 19th and early 20th century. While a statement was made with regard to images of women he, that he depicted through direct observation, it could also be applicable to this painting of a model in the cot, for she is painted in such a fashion as if it were from direct observation of a forgotten or unnoticed moment. Sloan's image of a woman in a cot differs from other late 19th and early 20th genre portrayals of women in the domestic interior, excuse me, domestic interiors, by both the standards of the aesthetic imagery of artists such as John White Alexander, as well as the private scenes of artists such as Edgar Degas. While Alexander produced a type of art that appealed to the traditional standards of portraying women as objects, Sloan refused to objectify his subjects in his progressive images. Sloan and Degas share similarities but differences as well. While they similarly ignored decorative conventions um, in his portrayals of, uh, excuse me, of lower class women, Sloan chose to engender dignity in his female subjects through, through their poses of this, through his poses, while Degas does not. The subject of the cot can be inferred to be a depiction of a lower class woman due to the Ashcan credo and Sloan's insistence in portraying the real American scene, that of the middle or lower class of New York. The costume that the subject wears is a simple chemise with no indication of adornment, further suggesting the subject lacks financial funds to supply herself with a more lavish dressing gown. Also, the title of the image, the cot, stipulates that the bed within the image is a simple cot, not a fancy chaise or elaborate bed of, middle, of a middle or upper class person. The thick broken brush strokes and unsettled lines throughout the composition heighten the sense of informality of the image. This is an intimate moment of an early 20th century woman in the privacy of her own room, in which no other objects detract from observing the woman enact a seemingly daily ritual. Every aspect of this image attests the non-traditional narrative style of a new class of art. As Sloan portrayed the men and women of the streets of Manhattan, he reinforced the progressive America that Walt Whitman was shouting from the street corners. Alexander, on the other hand, embellished the style of concerns for defining women by the essentialist conception of femininity. While each artist creates a dynamic genre imagery that presents contemporary women in contemporary scenery at the turn of the century, they differ in their social classes they chose to represent, as well as what aspects of the subject and the scene they chose to emphasize a central importance to their imagery. Unlike Sloan, Alexander, among many male artists working during the early 1900s, tended to portray women in domesticated interiors, of the home and were doing so to focus on the innate femininity of their subjects. In the late 19th century, women were identified as feminine by their body language, clothing, and the social realm which, with, with which they occupied, which was mainly the domestic interior. These are specific qualities of femininity through which Alexander and other aesthetic painters redefi redefined genre images of women, in which they replaced the representation of women's daily life with depictions of women as mere aesthetic objects. Women are, little more than objects in uh, women are little more than objects in Alexander's aesthetic genre images, as evident in his popular image, Repose. Each objective component in Repose, including the subject, the sinuous sweeping lines, and fluid brush strokes, are seen as pictorial devices used to produce a highly aestheticized image. In Alexander's work, the importance lies in how each element, including the human figure, produces an ideal image denying the humanity of the sitter through fully objectifying her as a decorative object in contrast to the imagery of his contemporary Sloan. Sloan in the cot, pardon me? Sloan in the cot refuses to incorporate the aesthetic imagery that Alexander emphasized in his image repose. Instead, Sloan chose to fully emphasize the humanity of the female subject. Sloan's model does not display herself 
on a pedestal, but rather hunches over tiresomely, covering her face, unaware of the viewer's stare. Sloan and Alexander created genre images at a similar time period, give focus on two contrasting aspects of society as evident in the artistic portrayals and choice of title. Sloan portrays a lower class woman in a lower class interior embracing the subject's humanity. Yet Alexander places an easy identical woman of status within a decorated interior as an aesthetic object. Um, differences between Sloan and Alexander persist in the artist's choice of title for their work. While the title of the cot indicates the lower status of the subject, Alexander chooses to exemplify the feminine stereotype by titling the work an expression of elite leisure. Repose, by definition, is, open quote, a state of rest and an art harmonious arrangement of colors and formal elements present to present restful visual effects is distinctly feminine due to leisure connotations, end quote. The title implies that she is a woman of a particular social class who has the ability to simply recline within a domesticated feminine interior, for it is an actively acceptable in the 19th century society of a middle class or upper, middle or upper class woman. This is in complete contrast to the lower class connotations of Sloane's choice of title, the cot. Therefore, the importance of Alexander's painting lies in the action and decorative qualities of the image, rather than on the female object. The title of the Alexander's work is as significant as Don Sloan's. Alexander's title reinforces the visual imagery of the leisure class, while Sloan's chosen title places the subject within a more lower class setting. After all, women of means sleep in beds, not cots, and the word cot does not elicit pleasurable visual stimuli. Now I want to return to the male gaze. Sloan was not the only artist during the 19th century who challenged the traditional conception of the male gaze. 30 years prior to Sloan completing the cot in New York, Edgar Degas in Paris created images similar to the cot in which he also created intimate portrayals of a solitary female figure, avoiding the audience's gaze. Yet they differ in how they present their female subjects. While Sloan's figure is clothed, the women whom Degas depict are partially, if not fully, nude and are either in the process of bathing uh, or in the process of bathing. This engenders a hierarchical view from the intended viewer, which differs from the mode of spectatorship Sloan implements in the cot. One image that the cot shares similarities with is Degas' pastel after the bath. After the bath features a single nude female faced away from the audience, entirely engaged in drying herself. The image is cropped so, cropped so that the audience is confronted with the subject's nudity. Her posterior is placed in the center of the image and her left breast peeks from under her body as a figure is awkwardly contorted. Both Sloan's women in the cot and Degas' after the bath present women in interiors, private settings in which the artist hides the woman's face denying direct observation from the viewer. Yet they present their audience with two different types of images. They differ through their obvious use of different technique and artistic style, as well as Sloan's cho choice to give it the female subject dignity by displaying her dress in a virtuous shift. But most importantly to this paper, their difference lies in the relationship they create between the spectator and the subject, which marks a large change from the European generation of Degas. Although Degas denied eye contact with the subject and did not create an aesthetic object as Alexander created in Repose, Degas' subject was still available for the hierarchical consumption of the assumed male gaze. And Thea Callan explains the hierarchical gaze with regards to Degas in her book, The Spectacular Gaze Science Method and Meaning in, in the Work of Degas. She notes the hierarchical gaze is based upon the mechanics of the eyesight of the viewer, which includes his eye contact with the subject and to what, which physical attributes of the subject are openly displayed to the viewer. These elements contribute to defining both the cultural and gender authority of the spectator. Though Degas in his images of women at the bath denies viewers direct eye contact with the subject, he confronts his viewer with a stark nudity as well as distorts the subject by placing them in unnatural positions, eliciting a cultural authoritative gaze over them. Sloan, on the other hand, neither allows the audience direct eye contact with his subject nor manipulates his subject in any manner to allow the spectator a cultural or gender superiority. He projects a moment of time rather than an objectification of a female. The separation of masculine and feminine, uh, the separation of masculine and feminine is not solely divided by states but also by lines of sight. Women with the image, within images can be consumed by the active masculine gaze. With this type of gaze, female subjects become objects for the for the artists and therefore for their viewers, which is evident in the images of Degas and Alexander. In Repose, Alexander's choice of focusing on the female subject's sumptuous form author authorizes the viewers to aestheticize the female subject. In Degas, after the bath, 
while the subject's downward gaze interrupts the observer's ability to fully implement a masculine superiority over the subject, Degas' contortion of the female nude body enables the audience to assume a masculine authority over the subject. Alternatively, Sloan chooses to create an image that defy this construction, creating an image of a woman who is no longer an object but simply part of a moment. The cut is, simply, is a simple image of a woman of the early 20th century. Sloan creates an image in which both his subject and construction of the scene denies both the masculine and social construction of, excuse me. Sloan creates an image in which both the subject and construction of the scene denies both the masculine and social hierarchical gaze in order for the audience to focus on the specific moment. This is achieved with the subject staring down at her foot, therefore denying the observer's direct eye contact, as well as a slight angle of the cot, which connects with the modestly hunched over female figure who gently lies her foot on the bed, placing the focus on, of the image on the specific connection. The brightness of the sheets and pillow, as well as the contrast of the thick brush strokes of the walnut brown background, further brings the observer's eye to focus on the female subject's interaction with the inanimate object. While Sloan, as part of the Ashkin Credo, depicted the lower class introducing American to the progressive subject of the female city dweller, it was through a stylistic choice that he truly defied the traditional convention of painting through a non-objectifying style which disallows the hierarchical masculine audience. While focusing on portraying a lower class woman, Sloan's image challenged the previous generations of genre imagery. In this one image, he reinstills a narrative in a scene that artists such as Whistler and Alexander were disregarded. Sloan's image also disputes the traditional form of genre painting, for in his image of a woman experiencing a presumed daily ritual, it is only her within the scene. She's not engaged in a social interaction, nor is the image focused on establishing her as a motherly or feminine uh, creature, which were the traditional modes of representing women in genre painting. It is simply an intimate moment of an everyday scene. Therefore, Slo therefore, Sloan asks his audience to reconsider the established perception of what a genre image should be with his narrative image of a solitary, wo solitary woman in the crowd. Thank you. No, this is, I'm really focusing, this is sort of a little bit like, I try to stay away from the socialists and sort of just really focus on the visual imagery of it and stay away from the masses and just really work with this particular image. Because this one doesn't, um, I do talk about his relationship with women though in my broader context because uh, one, of, one of the bigger parts of my lit review is dealing with uh, the difference between the psychological intentions and the social intentions in his work and so that's sort of where I do deal with that in the broader sense. Yes. <clears throat> I'm not an art historian, far from it. Um, and I'm probably older than certainly than most of the students here. Not probably, definitely. <laughs> um, but I like your interpretation of Sloan. It, it made sense to me. Um, but when you talked about the da, I mean, you made some, as the current vernacular, we had a pretty heavy remarks, masculine, authoritative, hierarchical, <laughs> um, focusing on the posterior, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm, not, I'm not an art historian, and I'm not, I'm not really a, a maven of art. But we do have Prince of the God in the house, <laughs> <laughs> next to my wife, and, and his, and his, uh, his portrait, portraiture of, of, of ballet, young, young uh, ballet artists. But are you implying that any male who paints a woman nude and especially focuses on her behind or breast is, um, breasts is exhibiting authoritative male hierarchical superiority. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just sort of, I'm dealing with in the context of this time period of the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm also dealing with the terms that you seem to have brought up again. There's been a lot of literature specifically dealing with they got the bath during this time period. And through, I mean, in my paper, I spend a good three pages dealing with a bunch of lit review on Degas on this particular idea of him with, um, with this particular images and the different connotations people have from this, from this image. I'm also with this idea with Degas, I'm also dealing with, um, that I didn't have time to discuss in my 
presentation, but also the ideas of the reviews of Degas during this time period. And with those reviews, I, I'm i dealing with, like, they, um, their issues with the Stark nudity, their issues with the prostitute as a subject in this particular image. So that's, um, or their, the belief prostitute that were his subjects in these images. So he was criticized by the bourgeois repressive purity types. <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm not about the bourgeois, I'm about the bourgeois. Yeah, there were, well, the reviews during this time, I mean, I can't, I think it's Heisman is how you pronounce his name, is one of the biggest, bigger um, critiques, critics of um, Degas during the late 19th century and dealt with a lot of his nude images. And a lot of people uh, who saw these images were very astounded by its nudity and his harsh, their belief that he was um, representing them in a harsh manner. And so, so this, so I'm sort of taking it off of their ideas of what this is and dealing with the other um, lit literature that has been dealt with with these images of him, such as in Thea Callan in this um, particular book. Yes? Um, I think you did use some comparison with the father with the Dallas Bailey, and I know you know about Mary's son, I was wondering where her neighbors. That's actually also taken out of this as well. <laughs> Because um, I start off talking a little bit because I deal with the masculine gaze, and that is, um, you know, Griselda Pollock, you know, definitely. And so I start off with comparing it using her uh, interpretation of uh, Mary Cassatt's At the Bath and use that to further my conception of what John Sloan's conception with the cot because of the similarities and with the, um, you know, with the denial of the masculine gaze and all that. So, yeah, I do, I bring that into my paper. That's sort of what starts off, starts it off. Can <laughs> um, just keeping it really narrow, I mean, if you're like, just going to do a formal analysis on this, I think the comparison between the two is really positive. Interesting, but I was hoping that you could clarify more for me how this is dignified. All right. Besides, wait, besides <laughs> the nightgown. Because to me, especially because it's sort of the dirtiness of yeah. the scene, <laughs> For me, it's what I think is really dignified about this image, rather than what you just mentioned, is I really think it's what's dignified about this image is that it's a moment. For me, it's not about her. It's not about just the fake, her female form. It's about what's going on in the moment. It's about her readying herself for bed. And I don't really feel, by the way, that he crops it in the way that she, you know, it's centered by her foot rather than on her body um, is not is not centered as it is in Degas or as in you know repose on the you know the female sensuous form, um, the angularity of the cot. I just I find it more of a moment and it's creating dignity for her by sort of not objectifying her as the main like object of the image. It's more about this actual moment and therefore I think he's he's giving her dignity in the image. Well if you look at this the way she's Contorted, it's extremely. I mean, this is also this, this is also basing my uh, studies off of other people's lit reviews and stuff like that, and sort of you know adding on to what they said about it. It's about the way in which um, the body is, the way she's holding herself up, and the way she's contorted. You're sort of, I mean, my eye immediately goes to her posterior, and. Um, <laughs> And it's sort of where the light, you know, and you're sort of just, you know, affronted by her stark nudity rather than, and the contortion of her body into such an unnatural pose so he could get what he wanted. And I feel like this, you know, Degas, in, I'm sorry, Sloan's <coughs> image is much more natural. It's much more about this moment rather than, you know, on the figure. And that's sort of where I was bringing that off. I'm just, I'm, uh, sorry, I don't um, it, it's just on the back of Lindsay's comment. This is again something naive to say. Uh, this is my naive view. But the way that the light is falling on the three paintings you've got here, uh, on the right falls on the on the body, the posterior. Uh, again, on the back and the posterior on yeah. the left. On the in the middle, the light is actually falling um, upon the fabric. Car. Yeah, that's the okay. details of the cast. It actually kind of reminds me of Edward Hopper. Yeah. If anything, it's kind of drawing my attention away from, from her. the figure. Yeah. Like you say, for the moment. To the yeah, that's sort of what I was saying. Sure. Yes? Yeah, actually, that's a nice setup. So, <clears throat> what I was going to uh, ask about, and that is, you know, you, you uh, talk so much about the bed. And in a way, the, the 
bed is kind of the centerpiece of the picture because of the light and because of the way in which it addresses us as the beholder. Mm -hmm. Of course, a big part of the whole gaze analysis is you know the way in which it produces the idea of the beholder. Mm -hmm. And you start to question with the big eye, you know, who is it that's doing the looking? Right? Yeah. Uh, and so you could say that this, uh, in more or less exactly the same way as the <coughs> it produces that idea of the beholder, you start to ask, who is it that's doing the peeping? Yeah. Like right? Swan said, uh, peeping in on the scene. And then, you know, you start to think about the way in which that bed addresses that beholder. Mm -hmm. And one of the things one might say, perhaps, uh, <laughs> about that bed, <laughs> is that it's, it's a bit on the cleavage side. And that it's consistent with the theme. <laughs> <laughs> that it's, uh, it is addressing the beholder in a very inviting way. And it is doing so in a way that doesn't seem to be oriented towards the model. Yeah. Right? It seems to be oriented towards us. And so the fact that the pillow is kind of pushed over the side rather than at the head of the bed, like that, and that the bed is kind of opened up towards us. Mm -hmm it seems to uh, be inviting. And so one question then perhaps to raise, uh, maybe this is consistent with what Simon is saying, is you know, is the, um, the desire or the voyeurism um, objectifying or not objectifying, it? is it being uh, redirected from the model to the bed? And uh, is the bed then kind of standing in as a, as a metaphor of something? So far as one might see it as being cleavage, <laughs> uh, is it uh, you know does it produce uh, you know does it uh, produce a, a sexual reading by another means? Okay, I hadn't thought about that, but <laughs> definitely something to think about. I'm take a male gaze to pick up on. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't have the right perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is very shabby. <laughs> Well, that's more of my conclusion. Um, but the reason that I picked this one, this image, is because it's one of his first oil paintings like this. And if you looked at it in the beginning, I showed you the other ones that he showed at the Macbeth Gallery, which are all uh, interactions in large outdoor scene, you know, art, art scenes of people interacting. Um, there are later images in which that he brings this into, and I just, and also, I don't really see this as similar as like other people in the Ashcan group of producing these kind of images. They portrayed solitary female sort of more in portraiture. So that's sort of what makes this image a little bit more special to me at least, is that it's sort of very singular in this moment. And though images like after this, he does this image called uh, Kitchen at the Bath, and then like the, you know, these, which is very similar uh, composition as this. So it is more, you know, there's more further on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.